everybody. Welcome to another episode of Food History Happy Hour. I'm your host, Sarah Wasper Johnson, also known as Food Historian. Uh, and today, we have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. And I am making my first cocktail ever in an old-fashioned glass, which I actually don't have any old-fashioned glasses, so I'm using this lovely little U.S. Congress glass, right? It's the Constitution um, on a glass I stole from my husband. So so if you are watching, you should go ahead and say hi. Um, and I will get started with our cocktail in just a minute. How is everybody doing? It's been kind of a week. I put in some extra hours at work, so really looking forward to sleeping in on the weekend and catching up and not doing anything, basically. Um, so, as I said in earlier, hi Marty, um, we're going to be making a cocktail called the Admiral Nimitz Cocktail. It's from one of my favorite little bartender's guide, 1946 roving bartender. Um, and it, yes, it is named after Chester Nimitz. <laughs> Um, I assume, anyway, since it's published in 1946 after the war, I couldn't find any history on it as to why it would be named after him, sadly. But it sounded delicious. It's really hot out already in June. Um, hi, Eleanor! So I thought we would make that today. So, it's a fairly straightforward recipe. Let me just remind myself, make sure I'm getting it right. All right, so it is um, a dash of grenadine, the juice of half a lime, which I'm using bottled lime juice, one ounce of cherry brandy, um, an ounce of dry gin, an ice cube, stir in an old-fashioned glass, and add fruit. So I'm going to add um, some maraschino cherries. So I think we're going to start with our grenadine. It says just a dash, um, and this doesn't have like a thing on it, so we're just gonna do one of those. That looks like a dash, right? <laughs> oh, and I forgot my measuring spoon. So juice of half a lime is usually about a tablespoon, but I'm just gonna eyeball it. We'll say that's a tablespoon-ish. Uh, and then it calls for an ounce of cherry brandy, and I have homemade cherry bounce. I have to use up my cherry bounce before sour pie cherry season starts again, which is soon, right? We'll probably have it um, starting in July, maybe end of June. So it calls for one ounce of cherry brandy. Oh, not quite. Perfect. And then one ounce of dry gin. So I'm not using my favorite American gin today. I'm using this dry gin. <laughs> so it's good to use an old fashioned glass. Um, and this one is kind of small, but that's okay. I'm just going to give it a little bit of a stir before I add some ice. I'm going to add a lot of ice because it's hot out, and I would like this drink to be cold. And then, of course, it also says to garnish with fruit, so I'm going to throw a maraschino cherry in here. Actually, I'm probably going to throw two in, because that's just the kind of person I am who doesn't want two maraschino cherries. Oh yeah. So I don't know why this is called the Admiral Nimitz Cocktail, why it's named after Chester Nimitz. Um, but it is kind of similar in some respects to the Singapore Sling and other sort of more tropical style cocktails. 
Um, so the Admiral Nimitz in a Constitution <laughs> old fashioned glass. Oh, I'm missing comments. Hi, Carla. Who else is on here? Um, so a dash of grenadine, <coughs> excuse me, some lime juice, cherry brandy, gin, and I threw a couple of maraschino cherries in there. So we're going to see what it tastes like. Mmm, strong but drinkable. Hi, Maria. Yeah, that's uh, that'll knock you right out. Definitely very cherry flavoring between the grenadine and the maraschino cherries and the cherry brandy. The um, gin just adds a little bit of a herbal flavor. It's not really a very prominent flavor. So, hi, Ashley. <laughs> it is pretty yummy. It is pretty yummy. It's a little strong um, for me. Probably I wouldn't want to drink more than one of these, I don't think. Um, but I thought given our discussion of kind of retro-y foods tonight that having a post-war <laughs> cocktail was appropriate. Um, so last week a bunch of you requested that we talk about um, jello and gelatin and I said that there's a little bit of a story behind there because a number of gelatinous things <laughs> uh, end up being headquartered in New York State. So there's three of them. There's uh, the Jell-O factory uh, which now has a museum, the Jell-O Museum in Leroy. Excuse me. Christian Hansen Laboratories, the originators of Junket in Little Falls, New York, and Knox Gelatin, which I have pulled up here somewhere. Let me remember where they were. Oh, Gloversville? Wow, that's really close to Little Falls, actually. Hmm. Johnstown, there we go. Johnstown, New York. Yep. So they all end up being in New York, which is sort of crazy, and they all end up starting at kind of the same time. <laughs> Marie says, I love Jell-O. I have to say, I don't eat a lot of Jell-O, but it's hot, humid days like today. Um, I could kind of really go for some, sometimes for dessert. Uh, it's sort of like refrigerated ice cream. <laughs> I think in that way, like it's cold and, and, uh, not creamy, but very smooth on the mouth. Um, but anyway, so they all sort of start at the same time. And gelatin, it's funny, you guys, I um, have started putting up uh, whole episodes on YouTube. So I got episodes one and two up on YouTube over the weekend. They take a long time to load because they're an hour. Uh, but if you want to go check out old episodes and you don't want to do it on Facebook or you want to share it with people who aren't on Facebook, I'm going to start putting episodes up on YouTube. And our very first episode, we talked about gelatin. <laughs> so um, I will recap a little bit. So gelatin is a very old dish, uh, essentially as soon as people started boiling meat bones, um, you got gelatinous substances. Uh, gelatin as a dessert. Um, dates back to sort of the medieval period. You have things like blanc mange, right, made with almonds and milk. Um, and gelatin remains a very wealthy person's dish for a long time. Uh, you need a large quantity of meat, um, or rather meat bones, right? Uh, usually beef bones are preferable. Uh, if you've ever heard reference to calf's foot jelly, that's literally um, a gelatin made out of calves' feet, hooves mainly. Um, and it takes kind of a long time. You have to boil the bones and then you have to clarify the gelatin um, so that it doesn't smell of bones. <laughs> uh, and then you have to add sweetener to it, which in the medieval period was extraordinarily expensive. Sugar was very expensive. Um, 
So for a long time, it remains a food of the wealthy. In the 19th century, they do start to kind of commercialize gelatin, but it was sold in sheets. You still can get gelatin in sheets. It wasn't super easy to use. Um, so it kind of remained a more upper class dessert. Yes, Maria says that's ironic because gel seems like a poor man's dessert now. And it is, and we'll get to why that is in a minute. Um, but so they started commercializing it in the mid 19th century, but it really wasn't until the end of the 19th century that a number of people, including um, Charles and Rose Knox, uh, and then the originators of Jell-O, whose names I'm forgetting. Let me just look quickly. Pearl Waite, yes. Pearl is a man, by the way. Pearl Waite in the 1890s. Um, so Jell-O, the gelatin that is becomes known as Jell-O, um, they invent basically the fruit and sweet version of it. Um, Knox gelatin, they make a granulated version. And the Knox gelatin story is really cute um, because Charles Knox saw his wife uh, making gelatin the old fashioned way <laughs> by boiling bones, right? Um, and he decided that there had to be an easier way to make it. There were some powdered gelatins already on the market, um, but he didn't think that they were that great. So they developed a pre-granulated gelatin um, that they thought made a very high quality dessert. So uh, that's how Knox gelatin comes about. And they do eventually also uh, add flavorings, but not to the extent um, that Jell-O does. Like that's Jell-O becomes very famous for its flavorings. Knox's, Rose Knox, um, after Ch Charles dies, she kind of takes over the company, which was unusual at the time. It's in the early 20th century. Uh, and she made a recipe book called Dainty Desserts for Dainty People, which I should have grabbed. I think I have one in my collection. Um, so how to use gelatin. But Jell-O was more like it was with the flavors and the sugar already in there, it was easy to just make the Jell-O. So Junket, which is out of Christian Hansen Laboratories in Little Falls, um, is slightly different. It's a rennet dessert, right? A rennet custard. Um, so rennet, for those of you who are familiar with Little House on the Prairie, right? Lauren Goes Wilder, or with just cheese making in general, um, rennet is an enzyme that is naturally present in the stomach lining of a calf. So historically, to make cheese, you had to slaughter a calf and use the enzyme in the stomach lining. Um, Christian Hansen figured out how to make that without the calf. Uh, and so he, would, he sold rennet um, tablets, and then later they created um, like pudding mixes and ice cream mixes and stuff like that. Uh, and so that is also coming out of New York at the same time. So there's all these sort of similar desserts. And as Maria said, they're, you know, they become kind of known as poor people food. And that's because like many foods that are previously very labor intensive as they're commercialized and mechanized, they become much cheaper. And so the, when the labor is taken away, it's sort of, becomes less of an upper-class food. Um, Jell-O, definitely the ease of making Jell-O um, becomes associated, I think, with poverty because it's a very inexpensive dessert um, and it's just very easy to make. The other thing that happens with all these desserts that coincide is the rise of electric refrigeration. We talked about refrigeration two episodes ago, but basically in the 1920s, we're transitioning away from ice boxes and towards electric refrigerators. And in the 1930s, we get rural electrification. So people who live in rural areas also have electricity and can have electric refrigerators and freezers and other things like that. Um, but they're all, these, these three products, um, Jell-O, Nox Gelatin, and Junket are all sort of riding on the popularity of 
refrigeration and refrigerated desserts um, and frozen desserts and people just really get to like them and they become super popular. Um, as I said, they're also crazy easy to make, right? You just mix it up with some milk. Maybe you have to heat some water or some milk in advance uh, and then you just stick it in the fridge and four hours later, ta-da, dessert. So because it's so easy to use, you start to get the proliferation of gelatin salads. So gelatin salads, I saw something the other day, somebody was like, the American definition of salad is very loose. And it's actually historically that way. So if you go back to the 18th century, um, if anybody's ever heard of the term salma gundi, uh, that's like an 18th century term for a salad, but it's essentially anything cold that's chopped up and mixed together can be a salad. So if it's served cold and it's chopped up and mixed together, ta-da, salad. Which means jello salad, cookie salad, chicken salad, ham salad, egg salad. These are all cold things that are chopped up and served cold. So not surprising that that's how we define salad. I think most people today associate salad with leafy greens and some sort of dressing. That comes out of the French tradition more than it does out of the British tradition, and that's a much more recent um, import to American shores in a lot of ways. Um, whereas more composed salads of chopped vegetables and cold meats and fruits and things like that are a lot older. So we kind of have that going on with our salad tradition. And then, yes, Maria, why would a green salad be in the same category as a tuna salad, right? It's just cold things, chopped up cold things, served cold, maybe with a dressing, maybe not. Um, but yes, that's, that's how Americans get our salad terminology. Um, but at the same time, the other thing that's happening is uh, terrines and pâtés and aspics, which are savory gelatinous things that are also served cold. So I think I mentioned in previous episodes, if anyone has ever cooked um, bone-in chicken for chicken stock or for soup, and then you refrigerate the leftovers and the next day it's solidified. Um, that is basically the start of aspic, right? So you take um, stock that you have cooked from bones, right? And you suspend things in it and you pour it in a mold and you let it chill and then you turn it out and you slice it and that's aspic. Um, pate and other terrines and things are, are similar. Terrines are usually layered. Um, but still often gelatinous, uh, usually involving uh, bone broth and things like that. Um, if you've ever had scrapple or head cheese, that's a type, similar type of um, aspic, terrine sort of thing going on. So we have the fruit and creamy based dessert gelatins. We have the everything chopped up and served cold salads, and then we have terrines and aspics, and they all sort of come together <laughs> in the mid 20, early to mid 20th century um, with gelatin and things like that, because all of a sudden you don't need to boil beef bones for hours to get bone stock um, to make your aspic. You can just use jello or Knox gelatin to get that same effect, right? You don't even need meat. And we have kind of an unholy alliance of um, convenience foods. <laughs> so you have canned fruits and vegetables, right, which we've discussed in previous episodes. Um, we have commercially available gelatin. And we also have Cool Whip, which sadly I did not, I should have researched the history of Cool Whip before this talk and I didn't. Um, but that's another thing that kind of comes into the floor. Pre prior to Cool Whip, we had commercially prepared mayonnaise, 
that features heavily in a lot of early gelatin salad recipes. Um, so all of these really convenient things that you can throw together and put in a mold and stick in the fridge and it looks, you know, very fancy. You have this molded creation with all of these glistening things suspended in the clear gelatin. You can slice it, right? And it looks very visually appealing. And again, this is coming out of molded desserts, um, molded ice creams were extremely popular among the upper class in the Victorian era and at the end of the 19th century. So I see sort of all the molded gelatins as sort of a, a, a you know, kind of working class and middle class people eating those in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. So that's kind of a holdover from that earlier, um, more upper class uh, fashion, right? So particularly as you get away from the coasts, Midwest, I'm looking at you, um, and you get further away from the super rich, things that were in fashion, you know, 10 years ago for the super rich kind of still are in fashion for um, middle and lower middle class people further away because it just takes longer for the fashions to get there. And also people in more conservative areas tend to hold on to things for a little bit longer. What just happened to my screen? It went like green. Um, that's weird. Anyway, we'll just keep going, even though it looks super weird to me right now. <laughs> I hope my computer's not dying, you guys. That would be bad. Um, so that's kind of the story of gelatin. Marty shared on my personal wall this really awful, um, jello mold with, I think it was cubed ham and peas and cubed carrots, probably canned or frozen, uh, olives, giant green pimento stuffed olives, um, what Marty thinks was canned oysters looked like this horrible gray droopy stuff on top, and then sliced kiwi fruit in a jello mold. That's not something that I would eat. <laughs> oh, Sarah Foreman, yes. On the way back from my wedding, you stopped at the Jell-O Museum. I have to go. I haven't been there. I feel like I need to go. They actually asked me a couple of years ago um, if I wanted to do a panel with them and also somebody doing research on Rose Knox. Um, and it turned out they didn't need me for an academic panel, but I was like, sure, I'll do research on Christian Hansen Laboratories. And then I didn't actually do it. but. All three of those companies are still in business. Um, Junket, I recently learned, is now family owned again. Somebody bought it out. Um, yeah, Cammy, I was not expecting the kiwi either. <laughs> I was like, really weird choice. Really weird choice. Um, but Junket, Christian Hansen Laboratories, is, is now family owned again. Knox Gelatin is still around. Obviously, Jello is still around. Um, and jello salads are still around. I grew up eating gelatin salads. I think I mentioned here before that um, my favorite that my grandmother would always make for Thanksgiving was called sea foam salad, um, which was lime jello, of course, it's like their most popular flavor. Lime jello with canned pears and Cool Whip, and then once the jello and the pears are set, you beat them with like a rotary electric mixer, but you know, like the rotary beater, so it breaks it all up, and then you mix in Cool Whip, and it looks like um, sea foam. Marty, I didn't, I did, where did I see the history on the Jello shot? I did see it, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, let me see if I can find it, I have like a million tabs open right now. <laughs> uh, I heard something about the Jello shot was like a way for people to get around alcohol restrictions, not in the prohibition, like maybe on a military base. Um, I'll have to see if I can find it later. But yes, that, so it had an earlier, um, an earlier history than I had imagined. Let me just see if I can. Uh, I 
forgot my phone in the other room. Okay, yes. <laughs> uh, America's singer-songwriter Tom Lehrer claims to have invented the jello shot in the 1950s to circumvent restrictions on alcoholic beverages at the army base where he was stationed. But then someone else is like, no, that's wrong. So I'll have to look into it a little bit more. But um, yeah, 1950s, which I would not have guessed. I would have thought it was probably the 70s or later because that seems like a very big 1970s kind of thing that could happen. Yes, Eleanor is talking about the plastic jello molds that were like bunt pans, right? Yep, that was a thing. Um, Maria asks, is it more popular in certain regions of the country now? So stereotypically, uh, it is more popular in the Midwest and the South. Um, I think predominantly in the Midwest. Um, definitely I grew up eating in the Midwest. Uh, and a bunch of other salads that were not really salads at all, like cookie salad. For those of you who don't know, um, cookie salad is pudding, usually with like fruit cocktail and Cool Whip and then fudge stripe cookies. There's also Snickers salad, which is a very Midwestern thing. Um, oh, Marty says, I'm trying to imagine my grandparents taking jello shots. <laughs> I mean, why not? They put everything else in jello, right? Anyway, so yeah, Jello, very interesting stuff going on. It's just this like this American thing that persists. I don't know that Jello is very popular in other countries. Um, I don't think it is anyway. I haven't seen much evidence of it. Uh, but yeah, yep. And also, I think a weird American thing is like just straight up Jello with Cool Whip or whipped cream on top. Like that's a very industrial cafeteria, hospital, nursing home, school, lunch kind of thing that happens. <laughs> Again, because it's so easy. Oh, so there's a strawberry pretzel salad. Yes, that's another really good one. Um, also coming out of this is Jell-O, once taken into pudding, which is in the 1930s, instant pudding, well, not instant pudding, but powdered pudding mixes and stuff like that. Um, you start to get the combination of boxed cake mixes and pudding, <laughs> powdered pudding mix, you know, like poke cake, have you ever heard of a poke cake? Um, that's usually a combination of boxed cake mix and either jello or pudding. Um, I think I've mentioned before that boxed cake mixes when they first came out, all you had to do was add water and housewives like didn't like that because it wasn't enough like real baking. So they like took it a step back and they said you had to add oil, water, and an egg to the mix and then that was more like baking. So that's how we get the box cake mix. Yeah, Maria, I don't know that a lot of people eat Jell-O on the regular anymore. Definitely, you you know, you said you get it at the diner or maybe yourself. I think people still make it, but it's very unfashionable to eat, right? So, um, like you said earlier, it's considered kind of low class, uh, associated with poverty, things like that. Um, I've always thought it was interesting that that Jello cups and pudding cups persist. Like, you go to the grocery store and buy the little pre-made single serving of Jello. <laughs> so much more expensive than just getting the box of jello and making it. I don't know, but that's a thing. Still, I guess it's convenient for school lunches, box lunches and stuff like that, but that always surprises me. Anyway, so that's pretty much all I have to say about jello, other than to say that um, I will probably be sharing some information about Rose Knox, because she seems like a total badass. Um, for instance, she was one of the first people, she had like a lot of really liberal labor policies in her factories. Um, yeah, what is she, where is it here? Um, yeah, so in 
1913, she instituted a five-day work week along with two weeks paid vacation per year and paid sick leave, and then did not fire anybody during the Great Depression. Yeah. Yep. Pretty cool lady. So, she's neat. Yes, it is fascinating, Maria. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm going to take a drink because my ice is melting. It's better with the ice melting. <laughs> it's a little less like paint thinner, I think. Not that it was really like paint thinner. I just, very alcoholic drinks are not really my thing. It is good, though. Um, so the other thing I said we we're going to talk about tonight by request uh, was about easy bake ovens. We're just going to stay in the 60s and 70s here. So easy bake ovens were a toy that was invented in 1963 by, what's the guy's name? I always forget his name. Um, this is going to drive me crazy. Ronald Howes. So he worked for the toy company Kenner. Um, and he had been inspired by street vendors in New York City, right? Little temporary, not temporary, portable food carts and stuff like that. And how the Easy Bake Oven works is, um, although they have changed it back and forth over the years, but basically it's an incandescent light bulb that provides the heat source, um, which gets it up to 350 degrees. And that's what you can bake with. Um, they had a lot of different incarnations over the years. Oh, really? <laughs> a little stink bug friend crawling across the camera. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Um, okay, dude. You're going to have to not be on my camera right now. Come here. Go away. Come on. Get off. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so it had a lot of different incarnations, some of which looked like, you know, ranges, oven ranges, some of which were just like a little oven. The most recent ones in like the mid 2000s are very space agey looking and like not in a good way, I don't think. Um, but they do still make them. You can still get them for a while there. Um, Betty Crocker and I think also Pillsbury were making mixes. Right, you can make your own brownies or like there was like some M&M branded stuff, um, cookies, things like that. And then most horrifically, <laughs> there was, oh gosh, when was it? Sometime in the 90s, I think. Um, where is it here? Does it tell me on this one? There was like a boys version that was like supposed to be gross it had like spiders and slime on the outside <laughs> we had to try and get boys interested in cooking on them and that seems very stereotypical to me but um that was a thing that they did uh and i don't think it's as popular a toy in this day and age i think because more people are just like letting their kids help in the kitchen i guess i don't know um but definitely when it came out it was a huge hit okay yes creepy crawlers thank you marty <laughs> <laughs> that was the boy version of the Easy Bake Oven. I don't know why they just didn't make it look like a real oven like they did in the 60s and 70s. There was definitely some avocado green oven, Easy Bake Ovens. Like, that was a thing. Like, just make it look like a real oven. And then it doesn't have to be gendered. I don't get that. But anyway, so that's a very brief history of Easy Bake Ovens, dates to the 60s. And I, you know, people would probably ask, well, why did we have Easy Bake Oven? And definitely there were, you know, prior to that, people would, women in particular, would let their daughters, like, help them cook. You know, you talk about making tiny pies with leftover pie crust or, you know, making, roll, letting them roll out their own little doll-sized cookies while you're baking, things like that. Um, but I think in particular in the 1960s, there were a lot more women starting to work outside the home. Um, and also kind of some weird stuff going on politically with, um, you know, feminism and what's a woman's place in the home. And so I think there was some nostalgia for this kind of thing. And I think because it was 
so interactive. Like, it was a real oven that you could actually bake things in, but it was safer for kids to use than a full-size oven. Um, I think that had a lot to do with the popularity of Easy Bake Ovens. Um, so yeah, that's my little short overview. I'll probably share some sources in the blog post. Does anybody have any other questions for me this week? Lots of stuff going on in the world, you guys. Is anybody else drinking a alcoholic beverage with me this evening? I don't really have a lot else to talk about. Um, I have been petting the book as often as possible. I've been working a lot on uh, farmerettes. I did find a very interesting reference. So part of how I do my research is, um, Oh, Maria says today is donut day. Yes, I didn't go and get a donut, which makes me very sad. We can talk about donuts too, but I'm gonna talk about farm rats first. Um, so part of my research is trying to figure out who had farm rat farms where and when. And farm rats, the term farm rats actually predates the First World War by a number of years. The very first farm rat um, education camp in New York uh, is in 1911 very closely tied to the suffragette movement. But one of the articles that I've been transcribing, it's very long, but it's very well written and very interesting. Um, but a couple of the articles on this one um, woman's agricultural camp in Westchester County uh, near Mount Kisco, I think, um, they talk about, you know, like the everyday lives, the farm rats, and one article talks about the food and cooking that's going on. And they mention a Negro cook, Martha. So there's three dietitians, white, young white women dietitians, and this Negro cook, um, black, obviously, named Martha. She doesn't have a last name because it's 1917 and it's a miracle she's in the newspaper at all. Um, and so I got very excited about that. And then later in the article, because of course she, they talked about her being the cook and then the dietitians were like, kind of preliminarily made it seem like they were her assistants. But then later they refer to the kitchen assistant and her three directors. And I was kind of like, really? So anyway, that was disappointing. But it was exciting to see any reference to a person of color at all because when you're studying World War I, uh, home front, there's just not a lot of that going on in the newspapers unless you go to um, black-owned media, which is also on my list. But sadly, hardly any of that is digitized, which is ridiculous, and the Library of Congress and other institutions that have black newspapers should get on that and digitize them, because that's ridiculous that they're not digitized. All right, so donuts, yes. Donuts do have a strong World War I um, connection. So, and it has a lot to do with the Salvation Army and the Red Cross. So there were definitely young women who went overseas during World War I to sort of serve as like hospitality people, sort of. There were women who uh, drove transport trucks uh, there were nurses and other Red Cross personnel. There were women in clerical positions um, and also women in the canteens that they would run for the soldiers. And there's sort of an apocryphal story of a couple of women who were close to the front lines. They didn't have a lot of resources and they had to, you know, kind of boost morale and make a treat for the men. And they had lard and they had flour and they had sugar. And that was pretty much it. And someone said, I know, let's make donuts. Because you just need flour and fat and sugar. You can make a donut. If you have yeast, you can make a raised donut. I'm guessing these were more like cake donuts. And then of course, if you have ample lard, you can use the lard to fry them in. So that's what they did. They made the donuts um, by the ton, I think. There's pictures from the period of donuts just like stacked feet high right and that was like a treat um, for the men on the front lines and so the Salvation Army in particular Salvation Army girls become associated with donuts and vice versa um, 
Also, I don't know if anybody remembers the chart I shared on Facebook a while ago about like why does the donut hole keep getting smaller? <laughs> and in the 19 teens and 20s, donut holes were quite large. I haven't, still haven't really figured out why, if it was the cutters um, or because of how they were um, making them. Like sometimes if you hand form donuts, like sometimes you see people like poke a hole and like stretch them, that might have had something to do with it too. Um, but yes, they were, the hoop of the donut was much thinner than modern, than modern donuts. Um, yeah, I meant to go to Dunkin' Donuts today and get my free donut and I just ran out of time between work and dinner and getting ready for tonight. So I did not have a donut tonight, sadly. But yes, it is National Donut Day. Um, so that's the World War One connection to donuts. There's like everything could be connected to World War One people. This is what I'm learning. I saw an article the other day about um, Purdue, I think it was Purdue, got involved in some sort of price fixing scheme to f like with other meat packers to fix the price of chicken. Which totally plays into a bunch of stuff that was happening in World War One, particularly with milk. Um, and the Dairyman's League of New York was like constantly under federal and state investigation um, t as to why milk prices were so high and like are you bilking women and children kind of a thing. Um, and they were actually prosecuted under antitrust legislation following the war and basically that legislation, it was decided could not apply to farmers because they were trying to use it to break the back of cooperatives because they thought farmers cooperatives were unfairly um, manipulating prices, which, you know, you could kind of argue that they were. <laughs> but on the other hand, like farmers also have to make a living and unlike a lot of other products, you know, you spend the money on your crop a year before you get paid. So the volatility of the market um, meant that you could lose your shirt and you want people to farm, which means farming has to be lucrative enough that people will do it, um, which means that you have to give them the tools that they need to actually make enough money to survive. So um, co-ops also help stabilize prices. I don't know if anybody knows how cooperatives work. They're, um, easiest to use with non-perishable foods uh, like grain, um, but basically farmers all band together and they agree um, that they're going to sell their product at set price, right? They agree on a price. Or conversely, um, a lot of grain cooperatives owned um, grain silos. Man, this, really? <laughs> you guys, that was gross. Um, but you would put, at harvest time, you'd put all the wheat in the silo and you'd sit on it until the prices evened out. Because of course, when everybody's harvesting at the same time, there's a glut on the market and the price goes down. But if you can store your wheat until the, the market price levels out, sorry, um, really, you need to go away. Excuse me. everywhere in my house. Anyway, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how cooperatives work. But, um, where was I going? So, yeah, so price fixing. So I find it very interesting that they're prosecuting people for price fixing in this day and age. Um, but that's probably because, uh, chicken producers, it's not like a hundred farmers getting together in a co-op. It's like three, <laughs> chicken producers that control 99% of the market who are colluding to keep prices artificially high. Um, so I thought that was interesting. But there were a lot of price inquiries into various markets um, during and following the First World War. So another interesting wartime connection. All right, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, if you're just joining us, I made the Admiral Nimitz cocktail earlier with cherry brandy and gin, which is quite good. I probably could have used a little more lime juice because I didn't actually measure. I just eyeballed it, but very distinct 
cherry flavor. I've noticed that I made a lot of very pink drinks on this show, but who doesn't love a good pink drink? I do. Okay, any other questions? I think I covered just about everything that was requested last week, and I don't have my phone to check my list, sadly. Um, all right, this is very belated, but Maria says donuts have been really popular. Cupcakes never seem popular as much as donuts. Yeah, cupcakes are also really old. Like, there's, um, but there's some debate about what the historical term actually means. So there's actually 18th century references to cupcakes, but it seems kind of maybe more like a pound cake where it's like you're using the cup as a measuring utensil. Um, but definitely there's re references to cupcakes that go back very early, whether or not they're actually baked in cup-like tins is debatable. Um, but yeah, cupcakes had like a thing a couple of years ago, right? Everybody was like crazy for cupcakes and then the cronut came and blew everybody out of the water. And But I think donuts, I mean, who can resist sugary fried dough? Like that's, especially if it's fresh, that's more irresistible to me than than a small cake <laughs> with usually way too much frosting on it. Um, donuts are, fried dough is also super old. I mean, you talk about the longevity of donuts. I mean, what we think of as donuts now where it's like in a hole, in a circle with a hole in the middle, is fairly recent. Um, but fried dough goes back to ancient times, pretty much as soon as we could have enough fat or oil for frying in. We did it fritters, bread-like things, uh, anything that can be fried, we fried it. Oh, Marty says mini donuts are a Midwestern thing. She didn't realize mini donuts were Midwestern until she moved to the South. Hmm. I didn't know mini donuts were a Midwestern thing either. I thought they were like a county fair thing. Because <laughs> that was the only time really I ever had mini donuts at the county fair. Here in the Northeast, apple cider donuts are a huge thing, huge thing. They're seasonal. Um, most people say the best ones are from apple orchards. It really depends on the orchard in my opinion. Um, so, oh, Maria makes a point the donut has blue collar association. I would say that's fairly accurate and it probably comes out of, um, the association, you know, it seems like very like diner, bakery kind of thing to do. Um, so I think donuts in modern America have replaced pie as the sort of quick breakfast or lunch. So at the turn of the 20th century, like pie shops were a huge thing. Diners have all kinds of pie. Diners still have all kinds of pie, but people would just like have pie for lunch just a piece of pie <laughs> or for breakfast. They would need a piece of pie for breakfast, right? Very cheap, easy to make, easy to serve. Um, but donuts are even more portable than pie, right? So then donuts and other pastries became sort of the portable quick breakfast, inexpensive breakfast. Um, and they are very inexpensive. And a lot of bakeries, you can still get a donut for less than a dollar which is kind of crazy to think about. Not everywhere, but sometimes you can. Um, Sarah says potato donuts are a favorite in Pennsylvania Dutch country. Yes, that's totally a thing. Um, I just saw an article about potato donuts the other day. I'll have to see if I can dig it up and share it on Facebook after the live stream. But yeah, donuts, I mean, so when I was growing up, my parents have a floral shop, and when I was growing up right next to us, was a donut shop <laughs> and I grew up loving um, a type of donut called Norwegian sour cream which was a cake donut that was like slashed on the top and possibly on the bottom too so that when it was fried it got like a crackly edged like crispy crackly edge and then it was dipped in glaze and it, the dough had sour cream in it, and I think I think some kind of like nutmeg or some kind of spice in there. That was my absolute favorite and I would eat it like slowly to make it last and I would eat it by like nibbling off all the crispy edges 
that were covered in this glaze. Oh my gosh, it was so good. And it wasn't like a sticky glaze either. It was like a hard glaze. That was my favorite of all time. And then as I got older, um, I remember very vaguely uh, one of my great grandmothers, I forget which one, if my mom's watching, she can correct me, um, making homemade donuts, somebody making homemade donuts with nutmeg in them. Just plain, plain fried cake donuts with nutmeg. And then there was another um, donut place also since gone, sadly, not too far from our house that made like that old fashioned style brown fried cake donut, um, really fat ones with a lot of nutmeg in them. And they were delicious. Um, Maria, I, I'll let Sarah answer this, but I'm pretty sure potato donuts are not savory. It's like uh, you just use mashed potato in the dough. Um, hi, Tim. Thanks for joining us. We're just talking about donuts. And I was talking about uh, um, Norwegian sour creams. I'm totally forgetting the name of the donut place. I don't remember them, but. Yes, Eleanor, I, I've seen them. Uh, sometimes they're called old fashioned donuts with the glaze. They're not necessarily called Norwegian sour cream donuts. I think that was, you know, maybe a Fargo, North Dakota thing. <laughs> um, but the old, I've had like old fashioned donuts like from grocery stores and stuff and they are just not as good. I don't know what it is if they don't fry them for long enough um, or like the glaze is sticky sometimes. I don't know, but uh, yep, that's donuts. I think definitely the donuts that they're making in World War I were a lot more similar to the old fashioned kind with nutmeg. Although I'm sure the ones on the front, the war front, <laughs> I'm sure they were not grating nutmeg to put in those donuts. I'm sure it was just plain, plain fried donuts. But people in general, humans in general, I think have a hard time saying no to fried dough. Like it seems like just about every culture on the planet, if they have some sort of starchy thing and oil, <laughs> the starchy thing will end up in the oil and get fried and crispy. <laughs> oh, Sarah, I didn't realize that potato donuts were square or triangles. So I'm gonna make another um, Laura Ingalls Wilder reference, which is in one of the books, it might be in Farmer Boy, I don't remember in particular. There is a description of making donuts and whoever is making them cut them in strips and twisted them so they would turn themselves in the fat. Because of course if you're doing um, round donuts with a hole cut in the middle, you have to flip them over so that they cook on both sides, right? So they brown on both sides. But in this book, and again these are yeasted donuts, not cake donuts, they cut the dough in strips and they twisted it so that as it was cooking in the boiling fat, it would turn itself over and cook both sides by itself. Which seems to me to be, you know, a very practical way of going about doing it because then you don't have to sit there and watch the donuts and flip them. Um, yes, thank you, Carla, my resident Laura Ingalls Wilder expert. It's in Farmer Boy. Yeah, and I think there's even reference to like, oh, wait, you know, mother didn't use make the newfangled round donuts the hole in the middle. She did the old fashioned twist donuts, um, which I think is kind of fun. You guys, now I really want donuts, it's so bad. Oh, we're going on a trip tomorrow, so maybe I'll have to convince Chad that we should stop and get donuts somewhere. We'll see if he lets me. I mean, you know, we probably just go to Dunkin' Donuts and their donuts aren't as good anyway, so. Yes, Carla says in Farmer Boy Mother was too busy to stand there and flip donuts. I mean, you'd think she would have had one of her kids do it, but maybe they couldn't be trusted, right? All right, I can't take it anymore. I'm fishing out one of these maraschino cherries. Yum. Another popular jello fruit salad ingredient. Maraschino cherries. <laughs> Carla says the kids were busy too. Yeah, they probably were. All right, any other questions in our last five minutes? That was like kind of a roller coaster there, you guys. It went pretty fast. What is everybody up to next week? I have, I'm just gonna be working. Working, working, working. I am um, 
it's funny, like, I'll go, like, weeks with no media requests, and then I'll get, like, six in a week. <laughs> so I have a bunch of those that I have to answer this weekend, and I am, um, remember I talked about the, uh, crown roast of frankfurters and like vintage food i think i'm actually recording that on wednesday so hopefully that will be coming out soon oh and then also uh the irvington library contacted me and i am doing a talk on um world war ii victory gardens on june 16th and i made a facebook event so you guys should go check it out and join me Ooh, ashley says there is a recipe Online for Mrs. Wilder's Twisted Donuts. Hi, Kate Mitchell. Um, so I'll have to go look that up. I have never, I have like a phobia of deep fat frying, you guys. And also it seems like, I know you can reuse the oil, but it always seems so wasteful to you. <laughs> you use all that oil just for frying. Um, but maybe I'll have to tackle donuts at some point because um, I really love donuts. Although maybe I shouldn't learn how to make them myself because then probably I would eat too many of them. But I should do it just once, just to say that I did it. Baked donuts, I know you can buy baked donuts and now you can buy like donut um, molds, like baking molds that you can use, but that just seems like cheating to me. So we'll see, maybe someday. If anybody has made donuts at home, fried donuts at home, send me your tips. Um, I'm probably not going to do it anytime soon because it's really hot and even with three air conditioners going, it's like not really cooling the house down. So anyway, so that's what's happening in my life. Oh, Cammie says she's been making donuts in the air fryer. Oh my God. So I have literally thought about getting an air fryer, but I have all of these other baking appliances or all these other cooking appliances and I have like no room left to store any more of them. Um... So I just do my french fries under the broiler, by the way. Fun fact. Um, hi, Kate. Yes, you found the section of comment. Um, so if you like french fries, um, especially if you get frozen french fries or hash browns, like cook them in the oven and then at the end, put them under the broiler and then we'll get extra crispy. The broiler, I feel, is a very underutilized feature of modern kitchens. I use mine all the time. Um, mostly for making stuff like french fries and hash browns and things like that in the oven. Um, but yeah, you should use your broiler more often. Broilers are great for like making melty cheese toast things um, and stuff like that. So you should experiment with yours. You do have to watch them though. Like you can't, you probably should not walk away from a broiler and if you do, you should put a timer on just in case. Ashley, your mom would make donut holes. What about the regular donuts? <laughs> Ooh, Maria, question at the end. What is the most interesting vintage cooking or baking equipment that you have? Hmm, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> Ashley says, it is, is it a dough? Not D-O-G-H, N-U-T or D-O-N-U-T. It's both. Ashley, it's both. Both are acceptable. All right, Maria's question. What's the most interesting baking or cooking equipment? I mean, I do love my juice-o-matic that you may have seen on the show before, um, which is a citrus, hand citrus juicer. Um, I do have some vintage, like, shredding stuff. I mean, what I would like to be my, my most interesting vintage cooking or baking equipment is a food grinder. But mine that I bought at an antique store actually doesn't grind things. <laughs> like I have a vintage nut chopper that's fairly useful come Christmas time, although a nut grinder would be better. I should probably get one of those. My mother-in-law has one. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. A food mill. The one I have is not vintage, but food mills are very useful um, for old school like pureeing things, especially if you need to get like... Um, raspberry or tomato seeds out of things because it you know I don't know if you know how food mill works but it's like like a funnely thing with a mesh bottom and then it's got like this interesting like kind of curved scrapery thing and it's got a crank on the top and what it does is it presses whatever is in the funnel 
through um, the sieve on the bottom so that you're getting like puree out of it. So it has to be cooked stuff, obviously. What I would really love, a vintage one, is a vintage vegetable slicer, like the kind that's like the barrel and you can like change out the blades and you can like shred or slice. I would love one of those, but I think Layman's sells them, but I haven't bought one yet. So yeah, I don't have a ton of interesting stuff. I have a vintage cherry pitter from West Germany. That's kind of fun. I've used that before. Um, my vintage measuring spoons, which you've probably seen. I don't have any tonight, but uh, I think I used them last week. Those I love. They're metal. They're awesome. Nice and long. They have like nice long handles, which is great. Oh, Kate says she uses her um, broiler for creme brulee. That's brilliant. Yeah, I should do that sometime. Anyway, so yeah. Sorry I don't have more interesting vintage cooking equipment. That's pretty much it. Um, okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me and for asking such awesome questions. I love that we went on the National Donut Day tangent. Um, but I'm really hot here on my unair conditioned porch. Uh, for those of you who joined us late, we made the Admiral Nimitz cocktail, uh, which has cherry brandy, gin, lime, grenadine, and I put some maraschino cherries in because it said um, garnish with fruit. Uh, and with cherry brandy, I thought maraschino cherries seemed appropriate. And definitely I will be back next Friday at 8 o'clock. If you have missed previous episodes, you can see them in the video section on my Facebook page. Um, or I am slowly getting them uploaded on to my YouTube channel. If you just search The Food Historian on YouTube, you will find me. Um, and I will probably have that article um, about farmerettes. I think I'm going to post it on the blog because it's very well written and very interesting. So keep your eyes peeled. And thanks again for joining us for Food History Happy Hour. And we will see you next Friday at 8 o'clock right here on Facebook. I'm Sarah Westbrook Johnson. Have a great evening, and we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody.